Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 1960, the American director Stanley Kubrick made a film starring Kirk Douglas, which was widely acclaimed by the critics and won numerous awards. Spartacus was based on the story of an enslaved gladiator who mounted a rebellion against the Romans in the first century BC. During the course of this slave revolt, he managed to defeat the mighty Roman legions on several occasions before Rome was finally victorious. Much of Spartacus' life is contested, and the ancient text texts that give accounts of Israel are often contradictory, but a coherent figure does seem to emerge, and is one of the few figures from the ancient world who can be named by most people in Britain today. Over the last few centuries, Spartacus has provided inspiration for those trying to escape oppression, whether slavery or the existing political order, and has become an icon for many people in the modern world, in capitalist and in communist societies. With me to discuss Spartacus are Mary Beard, Professor of Classics at the University of Cambridge, Maria Wyke, Professor of Latin at University College London, and Theresa Urban Schick, Prof- Associate Professor of Classics at University College Dublin. Mary Beard, Spartacus' revolt began in 73 BC. It's also known as the Third Servile War. Before we talk about him, could we tell us? Could you tell us what life was like in uh, that part of the first century BC in the Roman world? Well, the important thing I think to get straight is that Rome at this point is no longer just a little city-state in central Italy. For decades, even centuries, uh, it's had a series of extraordinary and extraordinarily bloody military victories, which has essentially given it control of the Mediterranean from modern Spain to, to modern Turkey. And that's had enormous consequences on what's going on and what life was like in Italy itself. And the first thing is uh, it's brought untold wealth into Italy in terms of gold, coin, bullion, art, literature, culture, but also the kind of human wealth that comes with imperialism. Uh, Really, hundreds and thousands of slaves have been one of the the big profits of Roman Empire. Um, People estimate probably more than a a million slaves in Italy uh, at the time of Spartacus's rebellion. But in, in some ways, the puzzling thing about it is that although this is clearly a big and exploitative empire... It doesn't have an emperor yet. <laughs> uh, the idea of a single ruler is still decades away. Um, and Rome is still effectively governed by its own traditional uh, Republican old-fashioned institutions. Major decisions are taken by popular assemblies. And P- Roman leaders are still elected on a yearly basis by the people. And, well, I think one of the problems about Rome right at this point is really that, that it's, it's trying to run a vast empire on the kind of infrastructure of a little city-state. Would you describe it as politically unstable at this time, to put it mildly, but still it's a question? Uh, well, the Romans talked about the first century and late second century BC as a time when daggers came into the forum um, because it was decidedly unstable, partly because of the vast expansion that was going on. And 20 years before Spartacus, there had been what was effectively a civil war in Italy when uh, the allies of Rome, the long-standing allies of Rome, went to war with Rome itself and were eventually bought off by getting full Roman citizenship. Um, But even more, really, in the in, in the internal politics of Rome itself, it was becoming a time of... Uh, really high stakes competition between individual big men who are sometimes competing with each other. Are these generals always? They were Mary? they were generals and politicians because part of the point of the way Rome ran itself is there was really no distinction between a military leader and a political leader. So if you really traditionally, if you wanted military power, you had to be elected as a state. <coughs> official. So there was huge competition between these guys who were wanting this sort of access to power and they were wanting this 
access to power because the stakes had got so big. You know, this wasn't um, a time when, you, you know, you would go up and bash up the your neighbour tribes and come back with a few cattle. If you got a big command to go and fight an eastern king, you came back uh, wealthy be beyond belief and also a kind of leader of the world. Maria Wyke, what do we know about Spartacus' background and how he became a slave? Well, quite a contrast to what Mary's just said about the opportunities of the Roman aristocracy in their in their conquests in the Mediterranean. It, it seems that he comes from Thrace, which is a territory that we would now pinpoint in the area of northeast Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, that sort of area. And it was um, very clearly part of the slave routes that would come into Italy in addition to those that came from the eastern Mediterranean in Syria, um, slaves coming in from uh, Germany and from Gaul. We're told that he was captured along with his wife and brought to Rome to be sold as a slave. We're told even that, he, that she was a prophetess and that she found him on one occasion with a snake curled up on his face and um, um, interpreted it as a sign of, of the enormous importance that he would have in the future. But before that could happen, he was um, sold as a gladiator to be trained in the school in Capua. And one interesting feature of that information is we're told particularly that he was not sent there as a punishment even though customarily gladiators were criminals who were being punished by being sent to the arena. <coughs> so we would imagine that going to be a gladiator for no good reason, but simply the cruelty of your owner, would have had some impact on his plans for revolt. Can I ask you, everything you've said is, is extremely clear. And is, there, is a lot of it contested, or are we, are we in the clear about all those facts? Probably the snake on the face is an anecdote that comes up with a lot of people in the ancient world where um, they are found with um, snakes or other um, interesting eagles and things like that that indicate their importance. So that, that obviously, I think, is um, an anecdote to make him as important as other people. But apart from that, the um, his background in Thrace, that seems very likely, um, and certainly, obviously, he was in um, Capua, there are one or two writers who say that his experience of um, military, his extreme military competence might have been accrued from having first been a mercenary in the Roman army, but that's not so clear. Mary, <coughs> Mary Beard referred to the, nature, to the mass of slavery, slavery in the Roman Empire. Can you tell us about the nature of slavery? I've read that it was rare that you have a slave state in history, but this was a slave state, Roman. Rome was a slave empire or state or... Outfit, whatever it is, like <laughs> republic, let's call it for the sake of a word. Well, it, it becomes a slave economy and um, is based on um, the social structures that involve mass enslavement. This happens in the late 3rd century and on into the 2nd century. This is new for Italy. It's a result of what Mary described as all the conquests in the Mediterranean. But there have been slave states, states with slaves in way before that, back as far as we can say. What made Rome different? Well, this is systematic. It's economic. It's about bringing in um, prisoners that you've conquered in your foreign uh, campaigns and placing them on the land. The aristocracy accrues wealth. One of the ways that they utilise that wealth is to buy up land. We find Italy is full of huge agricultural estates and slave labour is what is used to run those estates. So they're like agricultural plantations, if you like. And within the context of Roman society, there is a, a clear hierarchy of slavery. You could, for example, if you had uh, technical um, cultural skills, end up very close, very intimate with a Roman aristocratic family, perhaps even the tutor to their children. You might then have the chance later in life to buy your freedom or to be manumitted to be freed once the um, master has died. But the majority... The majority are working on the estates. The majority are, for example, if they're um, working the fields, are under constant surveillance, are penned in at night, really strong um, vigilance over their conditions, which were incredibly harsh, and it became very difficult to resist against those sorts of structures. 
Theresa Herbenshire, what previous... There have been a couple of significant slave revolts before Spartacus. Can you briefly tell us what happened there? Yeah, when I was looking at this whole subject of Spartacus, what I found the most fascinating was that he wasn't the most successful. I mean, he's the most famous, and you could say fame is a kind of success, but he wasn't the most successful in terms of long-lasting. So there... We have an ancient writer who says, if Spartacus hadn't been killed, if Crassus hadn't killed Spartacus, he would have done as much damage as Eunice, who was one of the leaders of the first Sicilian slave wars. So there's a massive uprising in Sicily in the 130s, and that could have lasted as long as 10 years. Now, modern scholars say, no, it can't be, because that's far too long for a, for a slave revolt. It must have been five years. But the, the way Diodorus um, accounts it, he seems to be applying that it lasted about 10 years. So that was very successful. And at the same time as that, there's an uprising in Pergamum, and D Diodorus says, at the same time as the slave war in Sicily, almost the same thing happened in Pergamum. Now, the leader of that is uh, Aristonicus. A strange thing happened in Pergamum in the 130s. A king died, Atlas III, and he bequeathed his uh, kingdom to the Romans. That's a very peculiar thing. I didn't think of this when I was an undergraduate. I just accepted it. But when you think about it, it's very odd. And obviously... The people in Pergamum, members of the royal family, didn't agree. So Aristonicus is a member of the royal family who wanted to reclaim his kingdom. <coughs> but anyway, he revolted for, I don't know, three, four years, and apparently the slaves... And Diodorus says because they were so maltreated, they joined Aristonicus. So this is two at the same time in the 130s. They are both defeated eventually by the Romans, who send out consuls against both of them. And then in the 100s, there's another one in Sicily. Again, five year, four, four, five years... And they seem to have taken over the whole of Sicily. And interestingly, when you look, there are lots lots more. When you look closely, it's just our sources are very problematic. They're very scanty. So even before the one in the, in the 130s, in southern Italy, there are uprisings and pr commanders with armies are being sent to southern Italy all the time. And they seem to be some religious element. They're normally referred to as the Bacchanalian conspiracies, but we know virtually little about them, except that almost every year, praetors are being sent out to quell them. Can we talk about uh, the business of he, you're enslaved? We don't quite know, do we? Not precisely how he became enslaved, but he, but he is a slave. Uh, uh, it's sufficiently authoritative about that. And then he became a gladiator. Now, let's just do we know, was he forced to become a gladiator? I don't suppose you choose to be a gladiator, do you? No, not, unless you're out of your mind, no. <laughs> not at that point, anyway. So it, the, the idea of being a gladiator changes. So... The film Gladiator is a bit misleading because we get a very glamorous sense of the of a term gladiator, but that, that film is set much later. There are two things to say about that. One is that that's under the sort of later emperors, and also Commodus was sort of a typically bad emperor, so one of the ways you describe a bad emperor is describing as degenerate, and being degenerate would be that you wanted to be a gladiator because only an insane person would want to be a gladiator. So, yeah, you wouldn't choose to be a gladiator. There are stories that um, Spartacus had been in the Roman army, and you could say that's the way that some authors try and account for his success and his military ability. What role did gladiators play in Roman society then? Well, they're the form of entertainment. It was a sort of. It started out as games they put on at funerals, um, and in the mid mid third century, that people are putting games on in funerals, and then they become just public entertainments, and then it becomes very important for, as a way to. Um, get voted into office because people would be, be very popular. Always, sorry to interrupt. Are there always fights to the death in, in arenas large and small across Italy and various other places? There wouldn't have to always be fights to the death, but I'm, I think that's why people went along to see the death. And they also have wild animals in there where they slaughtered. Vast numbers of wild animals are killed in these. Um, have we any idea how many gladiators? What, 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 how, what, any idea of numbers? Well, the, as the sort of like, as we get to the late Republic, the numbers are gradually getting more and more. In the people are putting on bigger and bigger games. So Julius Caesar will put on games with hundreds of them. I mean, that's that's a sign of your wealth. Again, it's this sort of lavish display of wealth. And we're talking about men who are trained in special camps and uh, are presumably given special food, special privileges, not penned up as uh, as Maria was saying. Most slaves were. Well, I think, up I think they're still penned up. Yeah, yeah but they they are trained. The whole idea of having a school is that you would put on a better display. It's not just slaughtering people. I mean, the Romans were into fighting. They knew about fighting, so they wanted to see skill as well. Mary Beard, can you tell us uh, how inside... And do we know anything about this particular 
uh, school or camp in Capua where, where Spartacus uh, was and how he got out of it with the men he, he took out with him. Uh, no, we, we know rather little in detail. We know there's a big amphitheatre in Capua um, and a- accounts differ about exactly what happened when he broke out. And, but, you know, in some ways... I mean, I think everything we're going to say about Spartacus today is going to start with accounts differ about, but because there are all sorts of variants. But there are, interestingly, quite a few accounts, aren't there? Uh, there are a number of short yeah. accounts. And all of them, almost all of them, basically say that Spartacus got out with about 70 mates from the gladiatorial, from his gladiatorial barracks. Um, quite how he did that um, is is a, a more interestingly different. I mean, there's one lovely uh, version in one author which says that in order to get weapons to get out, they kind of nicked the kitchen equipment and the meat cleavers, uh, and they blasted their way out with the kitchen equipment, and then conveniently found some gladiatorial equipment that itself was going uh, up to another venue, uh, and they hijacked that and used that until they got some good Roman weapons. Um, quite how they did it, we don't know. And, but I, I think, the, for me, the puzzle is, um, you know, well, quite how surprised are we supposed to be at this? Because Theresa's already mentioned, and Maria, the, the idea of, uh, of sort of penning them up. But, you know, Roman security systems are not like ours. You know, there, there aren't CCTV cameras and barbed wire. Um, and one's capacity for actually managing uh, to hold in a group of actually trained fighters because they're trained fighters because that's where they've got to be in order to get uh, get the audiences and get the money I mean in anybody looking at this now says this is an explosion waiting to happen you know tw- you know 70 plus strong honking lads who were actually really good at fighting and well trained um you know they can blast their way out of anywhere if they want to uh, their difficulty is what to do next I think getting out I reckon is always the easy bit for the slave rebel well, they got out, uh, Murray Wyke, and there's a bit of dispute whether they had three leaders, but they ended up with one leader. Quickly, it was Spartacus, and they headed for Mount Vesuvius. Now, why did they choose to go there? Well, I think perhaps Mount Vesuvius was a, a possible place of refuge because they seem to have chosen to go up the mountain about halfway up. This was, It was not volcanic at this point and hadn't been for centuries it was very lush. It would have been quite easy to hide out there. And I think that perhaps was their first purpose, was to escape from those Romans who were now chasing them to get them back to the school. So they hid out on um, a ridge about halfway up Mount Vesuvius. And here they demonstrate their first example of extraordinary intelligence and in- ingenuity because they they hide out on a ridge. So the Romans go after them. Let's yes. Make, let's Sorry. Send, yes. We're told about three thousand Roman troop soldiers went after them. Let's assume they're seventy, but let's assume more people have gathered around them just to make it a bit more fun. Anyway, <laughs> the Romans went after them, and there we are on Mount Vesuvius. Okay, so they're on Mount Vesuvius. They're hiding out there. They're surrounded by a sheer cliff face all around them, except for one narrow pathway up to where they are. We know that some troops have been sent out, as he said, about 3,000, which is rather a lot for a, an escape from a gladiatorial school. So clearly the the magistrate who was sent, Clodius Glabrus, was regarded as um, of sufficient authority with a big enough troop to be able to deal with this breakout. And what they planned to do was simply to starve the gladiators out from, from this place because of the, the only one pathway up to that point. So they simply encamped at the bottom of the mountain and waited for them to starve to death. However, the area where they were hiding was full of vines. And what they did was uh, pull up the vines and uh, wrap them up into rope ladders, an abseil down the cliff face. And then on the other uh, side, away from the away away from the pathway, Romans, yeah. away from the unsuspecting Romans, and then they then they attacked the camp 
total surprise. The Romans were not expecting anything like that. They overrun the camp and they seize all the weaponry. So now at last they don't just have kitchen implements. They no longer have gladiatorial uh, weapons which are you know, partly display objects and ones that they despised. despised. They now have Roman army supplies. Teresa, I mean, can you at one point the, the rebels split into two sections? So uh, Spartacus and his men, and we're now allowed to say rather less frivolously than I said earlier on, that, that people are gathering around them. They are, they're magnetic, they're attracting, they're disaffected uh, from all over the place. Numbers are always difficult at this time. A, a lot more people than 70. Um, and they, uh, they split into two groups. Do we know why that happened and what happened as a result of it? Yeah, of course we don't know why. But um, just to, to go back to what you were saying about people joining them, I just wanted to say that free people joined in all the slave revolts, which is quite an interesting idea, which often people find that unexpected. So that yet we're explicitly told that free people joined Spartacus as well. Um, yeah, Plutarch says that they were camped separately due to their insolent arrogance. They'd had a, dis a strange... Plutarch doesn't like anyone who disagrees with Spartacus. He's a big fan of Spartacus. Um, we... But they had large numbers. So Crixus, who is the person who's supposed to have split off, he's supposed to have had 30,000 men with him, so it would be difficult to camp with such huge numbers in any case. So, yeah, they split off. And when there's another incident when the slaves separate away from um, Spartacus, and that's when Crassus is involved. And, again, both times the slaves are defeated by the Romans. So that's the way that the story is told, anyway, is that the Romans can't defeat Spartacus directly, but they can... They can, when the slaves split, then they can, um, they can, they can defeat them. Then, so after that, he heads up towards the Alps, and there's a disagreement about whether some people wanted to cross the Alps and just go home. Is what our sources say that Spartacus wanted, which is kind of from the Roman point of view, it's a sensible solution. Please just go home and leave us alone. And these the slaves who had been encouraged by <coughs> all the success and slaughter of Romans didn't want to do that. So there's that idea that there's a, di a distinction. Mary, Mary uh, the underlying problem here is is just how we make sense of Spartacus, isn't it? Because um, you know nobody, neither any ancient sources nor any modern sources, have the foggiest clue what was going on in the head of these guys. Um, so all you can do, and this starts back in the first century AD, if you're trying to tell the story, you look at what is supposed to have happened, and then you say, well, so why did they do that? And uh, and there are a variety of different explanations that. You can you can come up with to explain things. So you say, so why didn't they go over the Alps? Well, maybe that's because they changed their mind. Maybe there were guys who were who were contesting Spartacus's control. And so the whole um, story of motivation becomes terribly circular because you're inferring it from from what is supposed to have happened. Can I, before you go, which obviously I'd like you to, I just like to tie what might be a loose end from what you said. They, uh, the the uh, Crixus. Uh, split from Spartacus and he was defeated and then Spartacus went on one another victory, one of several victories so he's back in the ascendant, Spartacus with his 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 gang and presume some of Crixus's men have joined him so Mary, they're moving up and down, they seem to be moving up and down, it's, well they are moving up and down Italy. What, 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 you, you're, you're telling us what you think is going on. Heaven only knows I mean, what, you know, the can't we, do, <laughs> you, we haven't got heaven Mary, but we've got you well, three right, okay. <laughs> The basic uh, the basic method here is to plot where Spartacus went and where, he, where ancient authors say he went. And if you do that, you get this sort of mad dash up to the top of Italy and then total return to the bottom. So he goes up. What's your construction of it? Well, I, I think it's rather more honourable to say, look, we do not know why he did that. We can make various guesses about why he might have done that. And... One is the one we've been talking about, that there are differences of opinion, so they go all over the place. Um, another is that actually, in order to get enough food and supplies for these people, they have to keep on the move. Because they're scavengers, basically. Yeah, and so, you know, you, you exhaust one place and then you, you move on. So it's a kind of migration rather than a march. Uh, the other idea is that they're trying to get more supporters um, and that... As you move, you can pick up more allies. That also may be true, but uh, but I'd much rather, I think, say, look, what 
you know, the the mad movements may be caused by any of those, but the bottom line for me is that they illustrate the real basic problem of the slave revolt, which is breaking. You know, the beginning is easy. You know, the first stage out of the gladiatorial camp up to Vesuvius, nearest place to go. Um, a bit of dastardly, rather um, ambitious strategizing. That's easy. Is what do you do next? And there you come into all kinds of, again, problems about um, motivation. Do they just want to go home? Or um, are they, in a sense, trying to, to, to offer a rather more coherent and systematic attack on Roman power? Maria, why can we check that up? Because it's one of the most interesting parts of the story. There have been various theories put forward. Spartacus was out to end slavery. Spartacus was out to perhaps to overthrow Rome. Spartacus was out to take over Rome. Can we just can you uh, rummage around in that area? <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it, I guess. Um, following on on what Mary was saying, um, the options have often been for us in in the modern era to to make a choice between Spartacus wanted to go home to Thrace or Spartacus wanted to attack Rome. Um, Spartacus wants to free himself from slavery, or he wants totally to overthrow the slave system. And I think one of the things that Mary's drawing attention to is precisely the sense that perhaps the ambition that Spartacus may have had may have well developed over time. One thing that's very clear is that when he escaped, he didn't try to escape on his own. He escaped with a community of gladiators, it's also clear that they did recruit. Can you just can I pause yes. that? Can you tell me why you think that's significant? Well, because if you want to go home, you would try and escape on your own at the dead of night, and you would then immediately um, reach one of the coastlines of Italy and try and get a, on a on a ship and sail away. And you would probably cross Italy west to east rather than all the way up north and south, hundreds of miles, with, you know, 100,000 followers. So I do think there is some significance in the, in the scale uh, of the, um, the movement and on its movement up and down Italy. It also seems to me significant that at one point, when they are in the toe of Italy, they seem to be looking to a possible shipment over to Sicily. And as Teresa said earlier on, Sicily was where the earlier wars were. Is there perhaps some sense then that in looking in that direction, which was nowhere near any of their homes, that what they were looking at was the history of revolts that had already taken place in the past? Were they aware of those? Were they thinking that they too could try setting up what we know as, as maroon communities in you know, an alternative society for the slaves. I mean, it's nice to speculate about all these things, and in a sense the gaps in the sources allow us to think about what these options might have been. Teresa, can you tell us what victories uh, Spartacus achieved during the course of his uh, about two years of revolt? You mean military victories? Yes. Yeah, I mean, because in, in some sense, just by surviving, he gained a huge victory, this sort of psychological victory. Um yeah, we we if you count up from the different reports, he, he won at least nine major victories against Roman armies, which was kind of astounding. Sometimes the sources say he beat this Verinius many in many battles, so it's difficult. We can't sort of say exactly how many are there are, but he's supposed to yeah he's supposed to have defeated them nine times that we can actually count perhaps more which took the Romans by surprise. They thought they were going to deal with this quite easily. But on the other hand, he had huge numbers, according to the sources. I mean, But he had <laughs> huge difficulties being on the mainland. It's all well being over in Sicily, as it were. Uh, you're, you're quite a distance away, and you have, they've got to ship boats over and such, and you know Sicily better than they'll ever know Sicily. But you're in, on, on the home ground here. You're playing away. Well, you're playing on home turf, really, aren't you? So that must have made it more difficult for him. Is that taken into account in your assessment of these victories? Yeah, you could say that's why it didn't last so long. That's why the Romans managed to finish it off sooner, I suppose. I mean, it's quite astonishing that he was able to march up and down Italy. And one of our sources says that's because the Italians hated the Romans so much because they'd just been at war with them. So the idea that the Italians actually let them march through, because presumably if the Italian cities had stood with the Romans, they could have stopped it earlier. So there's some kind of support going on there. Yeah. And, uh, can, can, were there any? Do you do we have any reports of spectacular victories? We'd all like to know about a spectacular victory too. Were there any of those, or were these just uh, victories that that one would have expected him with the numbers and and skills that we know he had to win? Well, the the sources seem to 
describe them as spectacular victories, they often have little sort of like mm, tricks that because they're trying to account for how how Spartacus was so successful. So, for instance, the vines. But there's another little trick that he played on um, Ver Verinius where he let them think that they they were still encamped and they put corpses on stakes and lit fires so that they the Romans thought they were still in their camp. And meanwhile, they'd sort of snuck off. And the only reason why the Romans realised they weren't there was because they weren't hurling abuse and stones at them in the morning to wake them up. And it was this strange silence. And then they, they realised that they weren't there. So this kind of trickery is sort of constant in the accounts of the battles. A yeah. continuation of the Ode Odysseus notion of a yeah. man being cunning and ingenuity. Yeah, well, he's like a Greek hero for yeah. Plutarch. Or, or the cunning slave. Or you know, that's cunning. what, you know, the slaves don't have, uh, have firepower, but they have, you know, they're yeah. smart. Mary, what are they thinking back in Rome? or around Rome. This man is going up and down Italy with a lot of people. It varies from 30,000 to 100,000, even more in some accounts. That, that, they're, they're massive people. They're causing, a lot of tr they're, they're causing a lot of embarrassment, at the very least, to the Roman army, defeating them, as Maria said, on several occasions. Nine, nine it's sometimes been said, that, that, around that number. What are they thinking? How are they working out what to do with this man? Well, it looks like from what we know, that to start with, although they take it reasonably seriously, as you said, they, they sent down 3,000 guys, um, it's, just a, it, it's just a slave breakout. And, you know, to be honest, uh, the Roman first response is not terribly efficient. Now, that's not so unusual, actually, because the Romans are quite often a bit hopeless at stage one um, in their military responses. What they're good at is seeing when the writing's on the wall and getting stage two um, into action, which is in the end what they, they do here. But it's what is very hard to, to distinguish is what the reaction was actually at the time from how it's later played in Roman writing. And and that a bit depends on how many people we think Spartacus had with him. I mean, everybody agrees that, that 120,000 is a vast overestimate, but nobody can agree on what a good estimate is of the people he's got. But certainly um, what you see happening later in the later sources, and that's all we've got, is that after a kind of misprision about Spartacus's importance, he becomes a kind of second Hannibal. Um, and, you know, he might have destroyed Rome. And there's the story that, you know, like Hannibal, he gets very close to the city of Rome itself and thinks, shall I go and attack that? And both of them, for different reasons, in a kind of mythological way, uh, decide they've got something better to do and, and pass Rome by. So... Uh, he certainly is written into Roman history as a big enemy. Um, whether, whether if we were sitting in Rome in 73 BC, we would have thought that, I don't know, we thought those pesky slaves, I suppose. And then they got hold of, they got hold of a statesman, they determined, they tried to do it, a serious statesman with a serious rich, who supposed to have said no one can call himself rich unless he possesses an army. Yeah. And... No, but I couldn't resist saying yeah. that. It's in one of the notes from one of you. So there it is. He is I said supposed to. Okay, Mary. But you're um, talking so about Marcus Licinius Crassus and you're giving him the benefit of the doubt by calling him a statesman. He was a big, brutish, rich thug, basically, but extremely well, a lot efficient. of statesmen, big, yeah. brutish, rich <laughs> thugs in those days. You said earlier on they were, Mary. I think that's yes, you did. <laughs> Absolutely true. I was just Thank picking you. you up on the use of the word statesman. But you said it earlier on. You said a lot of these Roman generals had to be statesmen in order to be bullies and go and conquer countries all over the place. Don't That's what you I, said. In, in your very words. <laughs> anyway. Uh, he we, was. Can I just turn around? <laughs> he was defeated by the Crassus army, which was, we're told, much bigger than his, and he was defeated in a heroic fashion. Can you just briefly tell us about that defeat and, what, and the subsequent uh, event after that defeat? Well, he he's defeated by the army of Crassus. It takes a, a little while. There's one point in which Crassus traps him in the toe of Italy and he's meant to have made a huge, phenomenal um, siege trench all um, across the toe of Italy in order to... Um, hold Spartacus there, but yet again he shows his ingenuity and is able to escape across it and to get out of this um, besieged territory. We're, we're told um, in one of the sources, um, that of Plutarch, who's actually writing a life of this thug, uh, Crassus. And Statesman. <laughs> yes, this. <laughs> Um, and interestingly, because I'm just picking up on Mary, interestingly, th this Greek source, um, 
certainly wants to describe Crassus as um, avaricious and cruel. And as a sort of passing uh, example of how that worked, he tells us the story of um, Spartacus and Spartacus's defeat by Crassus. And he ennobles um, Spartacus because he says that um, at the point when there was going to be the final showdown, at the point when Spartacus knew that the end was coming, he then um, had his horse killed so that literally he could be on the same footing as his fellow soldiers and that he then attempted to find Crassus on the battlefield in order to be able to fight him hand to hand. But unfortunately he could not reach him in time, he was surrounded by the Roman enemy and he died fighting to the end. As an imperator, it was said, wasn't it? Like, yeah, that's from Florus. That's yeah, from, so that, yes. and that word means general, but it also means emperor. And Florus was writing at the time of the emperor, so that's a very extreme um, statement for Florus to have made, yeah. So did this yeah. the intervention by Crassus indicate that they now saw <coughs> Spartacus as a very serious threat to the state? Well, it must have been. They, they had eight legions um, I mean, to send out against them. I mean, they, they pulled out all the stops. Yeah, and then they were recalling Pompey and Lucullus. It looks like... They really were taking it seriously. And just to go back to what Mary was saying, if I was in Rome in 73 and the, and the slaves rebelled, I think I would be really frightened. Because, like, when you go home, you're surrounded by slaves. You've got slaves in your bedroom sort of making your bed. You know, they might just stab you. They um, might revolt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the first thing they'd do is kill you, I think. But you, let's yeah. just go back to this defeat. You, eight legions. Can you tell the listeners what that means in terms of uh, a power? You well, he, t- he took six of his own, and then he took over the two of the consuls. So what numbers are we talking about? Um, These about are tri- f- f- four and a half, th- uh, nearly 5,000 men. Per legion? No, all in, in all. All in all, yeah. yeah. So. so that makes so. the sort of overwhelming superiority... Of, no, in a legion, it? sorry, for an, his I, nearly, I nearly so, yeah. 5,000 per legion, sorry. Yeah, yeah so yeah, we're talking sorry. about... Uh, hold on, quick, do, 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 About 40,000, 45,000 men. Yeah, that's right. So he takes that, he... They're very disciplined soldiers, and there's Pom- as somebody Mary said, there's Pompey behind him, and so mm-hmm. that they're really after this man. After the defeat, there's this famous uh, uh, Appian describes the, the, the he crucifying the six thousand survivors along the Appian Way. Is there real authority for that? I don't see why we should not believe Appian. It's a very dramatic thing to have done. Now, it's strange to have just made it up. Yeah. I mean, they certainly wanted to make an example of them. Um. I don't mean to be cynical about all this, but you know, if we go back to these statesmen again, and I think one of the issues about the way this military danger gets built up is that Crassus is looking for a big military victory. Pompey, who's actually been in Spain sorting out uh, a Roman rebel in Spain, is also looking for a big military victory. Uh, no doubt there's Lucullus too, wanting military victory. Now, it is in the interests of these statesmen uh, and their PR companies, which effectively is what a lot of Roman history is, to build up the danger of Spartacus in order to make their defeat of him the thing that saves Rome. And so I still feel, I I really, you know, if pressed into a corner, I don't know how many people he's got, I don't know how many, how dangerous he really was, but I do know that it's in Crassus's interest to make it look as if he has annihilated this shock, horror, mass rebellion of violent slaves. We've got to move on briskly to the legacy because we've enjoyed ourselves too much so far. Uh, Maria White, the, the modern world sort of, started taking interest in in Spartacus, if we can fast forward 2,000 years in the 19th century, 18th, 19th century. Can you briskly take us through the first time he came back into the consciousness of of Europe? Well, there are two ways in which he comes back. Perhaps the, the, the first and the most obvious, well, not the first, but the, the most obvious is when there are slave revolts. So uh, in 1791, we start to see a sustained slave war in what becomes independent Haiti, led by Toussaint Louverture, and he is described as the Black Spartacus. That's, that's followed by um, the prohibition of the slave trade, ultimately by all the debates about abolition of slavery. This is now in the 1830s. And when abolition comes, a statue to Spartacus is put up to celebrate these victories in Paris. So that's, that's associating him very closely with slavery. But when he first emerges, and most of the occasions in which he's utilised, is more as metaphor 
where slavery is a metaphor, where those writing about Spartacus are people who have never been enslaved but are citizens of the newly emerging nation-states and who want to use Spartacus as an example of the oppressed fighting against the oppressor. Can, Teresa, can you tell him? Can you tell us how he inspired Marx, Marx and Marxists in the nineteenth and twentieth century? Yeah, you. I mean, Marx, of course, was a classicist, so he knew his ancient history. And just the Communist Manifesto starts off the history of all societies so far is a history of class struggles, and it, and it starts off freeman and slave, and then patrician and plebeian. Um, and so he Spartacus is like, um, and he's epitomizes class struggle, if you like, in a very easy way. I mean, people sort of want to come in already. Um, but he also he's also supposed to have said in a letter to Engels, oh, I've been reading Appian in the evening um, and I've been reading about Spartacus. He's one of the greatest generals of all time and um, he doesn't like Pompey at all. Um, he calls him uh, a real shit, doesn't he? Yeah. I, mean, in, well, I wasn't going to say that on the radio. Is, uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. It is his yeah. words. <laughs> yeah. And then in another, there's a little uh, their Victorian sort of party game that they used to, the Marx family played, they had to say who their heroes were. They, well, one of these, what's, what's the vice um, you most despise? And he says, oh, it's civility. And what's your idea of happiness? It's to fight. What's your idea of misery? It's to submit. And your, his hero is Spartacus. Can you yeah. summarise then, Mary? I'm sorry to have landed this on you, but we're really out of time, unfortunately. What the, how the legacy continued? We've got we've got the anti-slavery movement taking it. We've got the Marxists taking it. Rosa Luxemburg, and on we go, taking them up. So where are we? And then we've got the Stanley Kubrick film. So where what, are we now? Well, the key is that the legacy of Spartacus is that myth which has generated since the late 18th century, and it still goes on. I mean, the BBC. TV series outnumbered, finished with the little kid actually in Spartacus the musical at his school. And it's not just, interestingly, a myth of the left. And one of the most surprising things about Spartacus is that when Ronald Reagan came to talk to Parliament in 1982, he also used Spartacus as an image both of uh, the West's uh, conflict with totalitarianism, but also of Britain's noble fight against the Argentinians. So uh, you see, I think that's a great tribute to, to the myth of Spartacus, really, that, that you know, it's the only thing that Karl Marx and Ronald Reagan have in common, is they both love Spartacus. Well, thank you very much, Mary Beard, Teresa Mishik and Maria Wyck. Next week, we will be tackling our talking about the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Thank you very much for listening. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.